you, Chairman Corker, Ranking Member Menendez. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to appear here today as the nominee to be the United States Secretary of State. I am grateful to each of you for the attention that you have given us over the past weeks. Uh, so many of you have given so much time and there are so many global matters before us. I'm deeply appreciative of that. Should I be confirmed, this regular contact will continue. You, uh, you can talk to Senator Burr. Um, I worked at that diligently. As a former member of Congress, I understand the importance of that continued relationship and advice that comes from outside of the executive branch. I'd like to take a moment here, too, to thank Secretary Tillerson for his service to the United States and his commitment to the smooth transition. And I'd like to thank Secretary Sullivan as well for him serving in the gap. A personal thank you also to every uh, living former Secretary of State. They each took my call. Uh, they found time to spend with. They've actually talked to many of them multiple times. Democrats and Republicans, from Secretary Kissinger to Secretary Kerry, were kind enough to visit me and, and share with me uh, their thoughts on how, if I'm confirmed, I uh, would would be most likely to be a successful Secretary of State. And if you know me at all, the two people sitting to my right rear uh, provide my ballast, my balance. Uh, Susan keeps the home front humming. Is always there to remind me of family issues that affect not just the Pompeos but family issues that affect every officer at the Central Intelligence Agency as well. And that keeps me humble, keeps my sense of humor alive. Uh, since I've left the private center and entered public service, they've had lots of opportunities to tell me to step back, to step away, uh, but they haven't. They've encouraged it, um, they've promoted it, uh, and they are uh, incredibly supportive of my efforts to serve America. A moment here, too, uh, to the men and women of the CIA, to say that it's been an honor and privilege and a joy doesn't do justice to these past 15 months. I've demanded an awful lot of you. I've set the expectation bar high. I've pushed responsibility and authority down to each and every one of you, and along with that, the required accountability. And you, the warriors of the CIA, have delivered for America, for President Trump, and for me. Perhaps the highest compliments of our work come from our adversaries who fear and are in awe of the institution and from our partner services around the world, was asked for more training, more intelligence, more joint operations than ever. To you, if I'm confirmed, this won't be goodbye, because no matter how this nomination process ends, I will be with you, I will support you, and I will admire you. And finally, I want to thank the President for his confidence and trust in me. My job at the CIA has been to deliver world-class intelligence data and facts to help inform he and the other senior policymakers in America. I'm honored that he selected me to help carry out many of those same decisions as his chief diplomat. Senators, if I'm confirmed, I will raise my hand and swear an oath to defend our Constitution for the seventh time in my life. Mm. The first time I was 18 years old, a West Point cadet. With this oath, I'll swear to defend the exceptionalism enshrined in our Constitution, which provides for our obligation to engage in diplomacy and model the very best, best of America to the world. Make no mistake, America is uniquely blessed, and with those blessings comes a duty to lead. As I have argued throughout my time in public service, if we do not lead for democracy, for prosperity, and for human rights around the world, who will? No other nation is so equipped with the same blend of power and principle. Two things I want to try and answer for you in the time I have remaining. Who is Mike Pompeo, and what are his thoughts and plans to lead our State Department? I'm sure we'll get to talk about that some more as well. Born in Orange, California. Well, we didn't have a whole lot of money in my family, uh, but I enjoyed school, and my brother and sister and I, we all had fun learning. When I was a teenager, I was an employee of the month at Baskin Robbins, not once, but twice. <laughs> I'm a movie buff. I have a soft spot for my golden retrievers. Uh, I love meatballs that I make with my dad's recipe, and I enjoyed being a fifth grade Sunday school teacher for kids that just didn't want to sit still. And although he'll dispute this, I can beat my son in cornhole every day. I love Revolutionary War history, country music, show tunes, and college basketball. Uh, but it was my appointment at the United States Military Academy that changed my life. It was when I traveled there, it was the first time I'd ever been east of the Mississippi River. I've seen some describe my leadership style as blue collar, fair enough. Um, I am not afraid to get my hands dirty and you will seldom find me ensconced on the senior level of any building. I have no discomfort with directness or confrontation. I prefer face-to-face -face as opposed to email. I don't hold grudges. I work towards a mission, and I'll always make room for student programs and youth groups. They are what will set our nation on its correct course. They're our future. Just this past Monday, I got to swear in a big group of CIA officers 
uh, it was always a very special moment. This one was very unique. Now let me turn to how I, I, I intend to work as the Secretary of State if I'm confirmed. Throughout my time in Congress and see I've met hundreds of State Department employees. I know them. Uh, and in the past few weeks, I've had to get a chance to meet dozens and dozens more in briefings to a person they expressed to me their hope to be empowered in their roles and to have a clear understanding of the President's mission. That'll be my first priority. They've also shared how demoralizing it is to have so many vacancies. And frankly, many of them said not to feel relevant. I'll do my part to end those vacancies. I'll need your help. And I'll work every day to provide dedicated, le dedicated leadership and convey my faith in their work their professionalism, just as I've done with the workforce at the Central Intelligence Agency. You know, when I took over as a director, say I just completed a massive restructuring. Immediately after my arrival, I began speaking at every meeting, every conversation about the agency's mission. We have these, I talked about commander's intent. We do these small things, they're called Meet with Mike, not a very original name, I will concede. But we gather up the first 50 to come to talk to me so that I have a chance to listen, listen to them. I wanted to know them to know what the President of America's desire was for them, and I wanted them to understand that I was depending on them. And you should know, when the team needed additional resources, I defended them, I asked for them, I demanded them. And the President, so long as he found value, never hesitated to provide them. I was able to persuade him. And with your help, I'll do the same thing at the Department of State. You have my commitment, too, with respect to this. I'll work with each of you to fill the vacancies that are at the State Department. This is critical to strengthening the finest diplomatic corps in the world, and America and the world needs us to be that. Second thing I'd like to highlight is workforces and their culture. I'll spend a lot of time on this. Uh, it's important. I'll, I'll proceed on, uh, but without getting that part right, uh, if the team doesn't understand the mission and isn't working towards the same goal, it's incredibly difficult to think you would achieve it. I've always done that. When I've traveled as part of the agency, I've met with State Department officials, I met with my own team, I spoke to them about the things that I was going to demand of them, the things I was going to permit them to do, and how I was going to hold them accountable to that task. I remember I went to a location, the housing for officers was simply inadequate. None of you would have allowed your families to be there. I didn't have a lot of time, but I went and spoke with the ambassador and told him it needed to be fixed. Uh, I wanted the State Department families and ours to know that we cared about them enough to provide living quarters that were sufficient for Americans. And you should know I believe deeply that the State Department's workforce must be diverse in the same way I've worked for that at the CIA. Diverse in every sense of the word, race, religion, background, and more. I will work to achieve that diversity just as I've done in my current role by focusing on demission and demanding that every team member, every team member, be treated equally with dignity and respect. And I'll listen. I had an old crusty Sergeant First Class when I was a brand new second lieutenant, said, Lieutenant, if you'll just shut up and listen for a bit, your life will be a whole hell of a lot better. Uh, he was right about that. He taught me uh, a heck of a lot how to be a good platoon leader. I intend to do that with the talented people that reside at the State Department. Let me talk a little bit about the work itself. By definition, the job description of the Secretary of State is to serve as the President's Chief Foreign Affairs Advisor. This was driven home to me in those conversations with every former Secretary of State to a person they were remarkably consistent by saying that job number one is to represent the president. For me, this means building substantial relationships with our allies, relationships that President Trump and I can utilize for both tough conversations and productive cooperation. It also means working with our adversaries where needed to make clear objectives and let them know the means by which we intend to achieve them. In this regard, I'm fortunate to have a sizable head start. On many as a third of the days at the agency, I was engaged with foreign counterparts. I've led the CIA to forge stronger relationships with those partners all across the world, in the Middle East, in Europe, Africa, and Latin America. I've traveled to these regions to demonstrate the commitment that America has to working as their partners. I've also met some, par some folks who didn't share many of our objectives. I've tried to find, and I've asked my team to find those narrow slivers of common ground where we can work together to deliver the results that America needs us to. Representing America also across promoting America's ideals, values, and priorities because they ultimately determine the trajectory of geopolitics, and we need to do that well. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I'll close here. 
as I'm approaching the five minutes. You, you should know that I have been an enormous beneficiary in my life of some of the most remarkable diplomatic achievements in American history. I served, as, as Senator Roberts spoke about, I served on the border between East and West Germany. And I watched diplomats over an extended period of time from both parties achieve an outcome against the Soviet Union and the Communist East that prevented my team from having ever to conduct the battle which we prepared for every day. It was remarkable work from foreign service officers over these many years. I thank them for that. It was the right approach. It was an approach that worked for America. I know some of you have read the story is I'm a hawk, I'm a hardliner, or, you know, I, I read that and I, there's no one, as you just heard in what I described, there's no one like someone who served in uniform who understands the value of diplomacy and the terror and tragedy that is war, like someone who served in uniform. It's the last resort. It must always be so. And I intend to work to achieve the president's policies with diplomacy rather by sending our young men and women to war. I know that I'm serving a president who feels the same way, and that while the military balance of power, you all did good work to assist us in continuing to build our military to be the finest in the world, it can set the stage and create leverage, but the best outcomes are always won at the dip diplomatic table. Um, you know, America's diplomatic engagement, political engagement, foreign policy engagement around the world has always been a big topic of debate. I'm sure we'll debate vigorously today. Yet all through my life, I've been reminded that once the debates conclude the carrying out of foreign policy, the actions that America does make it real. It is a matter of duty to get it right. And while we might agree to disagree today on what or the how of global involvement, we rarely disagree on why. It's to defend the safety of our families, the prosperity of our nation, and the survival of freedom in the world. Diplomacy gives us the chance to achieve these goals peacefully. And I thank you for the time, Senator Corker. Thank you for the testimony. Um